viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. The World Trade Organization, after working overtime, giving five grueling days in this year's ministerial conference, finally came to the consensus on nearly all issues that were on the table. The key issues ranged from food security to fisheries. India, which is a major player in these sectors and had its own sets of reservations before the talks, has also nodded in favour of the larger interest of the global community. The ministerial conference of the World Trade Organization that was held after the long five-year hiatus turned out to be productive as most of the agendas that were on the table for this year finally passed the consensus. The 164 body members approved a series of trade agreements this week. The agreements primarily included commitments on fish and pledges on health and food security. The deals were ground out over five days of bargaining at a conference of more than 100 trade ministers that was seen as a test of the ability of nations to strike multilateral trade deals. Content with the achievements of the year's developments, the Director General said the agreements that were signed were set to bring a difference to the lives of people around the world. She also praised the capabilities of the WTO to move together in order to bring change in the world. At one stage, a series of demands from India, which has been championing the rights of poor farmers and fishermen, as well as developing countries, expressed its reservations. However, with minor tweaks that were accommodated by the group, India also came to consensus with the rest. Bharat, apne kisano ke liye, apne khatya suraksha ke liye, garibon ke liye, puri tarikhe se tat par hai, puri tarikhe se yaha pe sangharsh kar raha hai. Aur mein aapke madhyam se sabko vishwaas telana chahunga ke Bharat के लिए जो प्राथमिकता है वो है कि हमारे गरीबों को हमारे किसानों को किसी भी प्रकार की ठेस ना पहुंचे इसी के साथ साथ मछुआरों के लिए भी भारत ने अपनी बात अलग-अलग बैठकों में रखी The WTO's rules dictate that all decisions are taken by consensus with any single member able to exercise a veto. The deal on a partial IP waiver to allow developing countries to produce and export COVID-19 vaccines has divided the WTO for nearly two years, but finally passed. India, South Africa and a group of other countries have long been demanding for the waiver of the patents of vaccines in wake of the disastrous COVID pandemic. Millions of people in the poorest of the countries continue to be at the risk of fatal COVID owing to non-availability of vaccines. Bharat ka paksh bhoat samvedan shil paksh hai. Bharat ki baat bhoat fair hai, equitable hai, vishwa ke hit mein hai. Aur mein samajta hoon ke aaj pure vishwa ne ye swikar kiya hai ke vishwa mein aur jada logo ko समृद्धि पहुंचनी चाहिए सस्टेनेबल डेवलपमेंट गोल्स जो विश्व ने एडॉप्ट किए थे जो 2030 का जो एसडीजी एजेंडा उसमें भी इस बात को रखा गया है कि हर गरीब को हर गरीब का अधिकार है कि उसका भी जीवन अच्छा हो प्रॉस्परस हो और मैं समझता हूं भारत उन फंडामेंटल प्रिंसिपल्स पे अपनी बात आधारित करता है तो स्वाभाविक रूप से हमारी बात को वजन है और ये वजन डब्ल्यूटीओ में भी देखने को मिलते हैं। इंडियन नेगोशिएटर्स अपीयर्ड सेटिस्फाइड आफ्टर द कंट्रीज इंटरेस्ट्स रिमेंड प्रोटेक्टेड इन द फेस ऑफ अ बेलिजरेंट स्टैंड टेकन बाय डेवलप्ड नेशंस। रिफ्यूजिंग टू डाइवर्ज द डिटेल्स ऑफ व्हाट ऑल कुड फाइंड बर्थ्स इन द फाइनल डॉक्यूमेंट Commerce and Industry Minister Piyush Goyal said this could be one of the most successful ministerials the WTO has seen for a long time. In the backdrop of several foreign media reports terming India as a tumbling block at the WTO, Goyal said India had played a very constructive role in the ministerial. 
Goyal said India had been at the forefront of finding solutions to the issues that are dividing the world. One agreement had also been reached on Thursday on maintaining a moratorium on e-commerce tariffs which is considered vital to allow the free flow of data worldwide. Many observers were broadly supportive and said the deals should boost the WTO which was weakened by former US President Donald Trump's crippling of its ability to intervene in trade disputes and set it on a course for reform. Moving on, the worst fear is coming true for the island nation Sri Lanka. The citizens who are battered by the ripple effects of the economic crisis the country is reeling under are planning on leaving their homes for places where they feel they can provide for their families. Sri Lanka's passport issuing authorities are overwhelmed by the number of applications they are receiving every day. And this adds to the woes of the government that has already been facing massive protests amidst a free-falling economy and evaporating forex reserves. Sri Lanka's Department of Immigration and Emigration is under tremendous work pressure as it is receiving unprecedented new passport applications every day. Hundreds of people have gathered before the collection counters, hoping they will soon be able to fly out of the South Asian island nation that has been battered by the economic crisis. The officials say they have not witnessed this scale of demand in their entire careers and they are finding it hard to manage the current crowd even after working on weekends. मैं आदि के तादाबादे इंसान सामान्य सेवा गमन बल पत्र एक निकुट क्रीम टप के सामान्य मासिक वितर काले गत हुए ना आओ विशाल तादा विशाल बैकलॉग के अतिबुनात आपे निर्धारिंग सेनसुरादा दिने वाले दिन राज्य कार्य करमिन तमाई ए तात्ते कलमना करने कर रखने में तबे इट टेक्स नियरली अ मंथ इन श्रीलंका टू गेट योर पासपोर्ट प्रोसीजर डन However, in these desperate times, when the application stacks are only growing with the day, both the authorities and the applicants are uncertain of the dates as to when they will receive their document. According to government data, in the first five months of 2022, Sri Lanka has issued over 288,000 passports, compared with a little over 91,000 in the same period last year. The situation is gradually turning into chaos and people are not able to get the process initiation even after standing in queues for days. Then the was tuna pereda the amman mehene me tinku api tinku indala ay pereda hawasa hatara dihin aave. Tama itin me polumi tama passport ekata bara form tika bara dinna beri Hundreds of Sri Lankan citizens have already left the country in search of greener pastures, with their prime destinations being India, the Middle East and Australia. Many of them are willing to do even menial jobs in other countries, for they believe that they cannot provide for their families if they continue to stay in Sri Lanka. The island nation of 22 million people is running short of food, cooking gas, fuel and medicine after economic mismanagement and the COVID-19 pandemic wiped out its foreign exchange reserves. Currency depreciation, inflation of more than 33% and worries of prolonged political and economic uncertainty are other reasons pushing many to migrate. President Gotabaya Rajpaksa and his ministers have time and again tried to assuage the angry protesters, saying the situation will calm down in coming days. However, neither have they been able to keep up their promises, nor have the citizens shown any trust in the country's leadership. 
the IMF and other international bodies support is not reaching the country anytime soon and people know this and even if it does it just won't be enough to prevent their life and livelihood plunging into a crisis that won't be over in immediate future to follow in Sri Lanka. Moving on, the Taliban, which now claim to have resolved all security issues in the country, attended the low-level Russian Davos at St. Petersburg last week and appealed for tech and skill support from any and every country who wanted to assist it. The Taliban-run government representative also urged the world to focus and assist it with food and grain support in line with the massive food shortage that has posed the risk of famine in the country. As per different estimates, nearly 60% of the country's population stands on the cusp of acute hunger. Mohammad Yunus moment was the center of attention in Russia's Davos summit this year following a weak international participation following the West snub to Russia. However, it also turned out to be a great opportunity for the Afghanistan minister to use the platform to put forth his country's genuine interests and issues before the world. And despite Russia facing an increasing ostracization from the world, Afghanistan maintained that it wanted to deepen relations with Moscow, which has proven to be a reliable partner in the past too. Afghanistan has the knowledge that the Russians are very good at trading and trade. The effort is to make the trade between the world and the world. Taliban-led government of Afghanistan calls itself a truly independent and sovereign country now, which wants to have better ties with countries across the world. However, it is also a fact that the humanitarian situation, which wasn't great even during the previous West-backed government, has deteriorated further since last August when the group swept to power. The country is in the middle of some of the worst economic crisis, with the U.S. not willing to release all the Afghan funds it freezed, citing the Al-Qaeda threats that might pop up if Taliban were handed that huge of an amount. Situation is such that Kabul doesn't have cash to even pay for the salaries or buy food. Western aid has been suspended because the Taliban government includes designated terrorists. And millions of Afghans face acute malnutrition and starvation in the coming months. India has pledged 50,000 metric tons of wheat to the country and has sent over half of it. But that has covered just one aspect of the plethora of problems that Afghans face. And now the Taliban asserted in Russia that it didn't want to depend on others for its future, hence requested the countries to assist it with technological advancements and with the skill sets and not with outright aids. The Afghan زیربنایی پروژه‌ای که زموج سر کوما کوکی نه زموج سر کوما کوکی موج ضرورت لرو چی موج ت مایی رانی که موج ت دمایی نیول رز دکی موج وارو چه افغانستان دکار دلاری پر مخلوار سی دکار و بار دلاری پر مخلوار نوارو چه افغانستان پر جامعه جهانی بانی بار سی افغانستان باید پخپله پخپله باید خبر کوات پیدا کی 
Experts, however, say that the Taliban would require to change its method of operations if it wants to build any form of credibility within the international community. Primary point being the equal treatment of women who are being treated as second-class citizens under the Taliban regime with all their freedoms snatched away under current dispensation. The international community has been reluctant as it believes that Taliban are really close to what they were during the previous regime of 1996 to 2001. And any financial push might prove to be counterproductive instead of bringing favorable results of peace and prosperity. Time now for Asia This Week, stories from across the continent. At least two people were killed and seven injured in Turkish air strikes targeting the Sinjar resistance units, a militia affiliated with the Kurdistan Workers' Party in Iraq's northern province of Sinjar. They said one strike targeted an intelligence headquarters and another hit a civilian area causing damage to nearby shops. Videos on social media showed plumes of thick smoke and fires ablaze while people ran away in the street. There has been a long-running Turkish campaign in Iraq and Syria against militants of the PKK and the Syrian Kurdish YPG militia, which are both regarded as terrorist groups by Ankara. Turkey regularly carries out strikes in northern Iraq and has sent commandos to support its offensives. An Israeli court this week convicted a Palestinian aid worker who has been detained for six years on Israeli charges that he funneled tens of millions of dollars in relief funds to the militant group Hamas. The Beer Sheba District Court found El Halabi guilty of supporting a terror organization but acquitted him of prison. They set a sentencing hearing for July. Mohammed El Halabi, head of Gaza operations for World Vision, an international Christian non-governmental organization was arrested in June 2016. Israel accused him of siphoning off up to $50 million to pay Hamas fighters, buy arms and fund the group's activities. El Halabi has consistently denied the charges against him and has refused several plea deal offers. Japanese company Casio's scientific calculators are used by children at a school in Indonesia's capital Jakarta for solving difficult math problems. Casio is contributing in different ways to improve education in countries around the world with its Gakuhan project wherein scientific calculators are being provided to teachers and students in schools. Kesio has collaborated with the Japanese education project Eduport Nippon for supporting talented students in Indonesia. Kesio's pilot classes are highly evaluated in Indonesian education. Kesio is providing scientific calculators to educational sites around the world to help teachers in developing leaders and fulfilling dreams of a number of children. Companies in Japan are introducing fame tech or female technology. This initiative is undertaken by the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry in Japan. Under it, attention is being paid to the health of female employees and not just on superficial beauty. The restrictions caused by the coronavirus pandemic have brought new changes in the beauty industry. People wear masks to cover their mouth. This prompted the beauty industry to come up with alternate methods to enhance facial appearance. 
ロの前まではやっぱりメイド・イン・ジャパンのブランドの信頼というのがすごく高いなというふうに感じておりまして海外からの注目度はすごく高くて今年は来場者が海外から来られないというのがあるんですけれどもそのメイド・イン・ジャパンというブランドはまだ存在しているかなと思っております美容に関する商材を作られているメーカーさんとか商社さんそれを取り扱うサロンの方とか小売りの方と出会う場所になっておりますのでコロナが明けて今年あの非常に多くの来場者の方に来ていただいてますのであのまたこれがそのビジネスの拡大とか活性化につながっていくといいなと思っていますフィムテック・テクノロジー・オブ・ビューティー・インダストリー・イン・ジャパン will once again attract the attention of the world with beauty appliances Moving on, India is a land of all faiths and the country's constitutional framework provides freedom to all to propagate their beliefs. In line with the same, the government has time and again deepened its ties with other countries on the basis of beliefs. Mongolia, a Buddhist dominant nation, recently got an opportunity to showcase four relics of Lord Buddha that were transported to the country by senior Indian minister and a large delegation. A large number of people gathered in Mongolian capital Ulaanbaatar and received Lord Buddha's relics with great reverence. The relics were flown from Indian city of Kapilwastu and were displayed in the Gandhan monastery of the capital for 11 days. Prayers were offered as monks chanted religious chants before Indian law and justice minister Kiran Rijiju took away the four holy relics couple was to relics to Mongolia for an 11 day exhibition This is a very very special uh, uh, gesture from the government of India and the relics uh, which I have carried along with me uh, the couple was to relics couple was to relics are very very special relics and four relics are being brought here India and Mongolia have interacted through the medium of Buddhism over a period of 2600 years. Following the emergence of Mongolia as a modern nation state in the 20th century, the two countries have continued to build relations based on shared historical and cultural legacy. Speaker of Mongolian Parliament expressed gratitude to the Indian government for showcasing the relics to his people who could otherwise have remained deprived of such display. I would like to express our sincere and heartfelt gratitude to the uh, government of India for uh, bringing uh, both the relics to Mongolia. So it's uh, on behalf of the uh, parliament of Mongolia, on behalf of the uh, devotees, Buddhist community of Mongolia. I would like to thank uh, to the government of India uh, for this uh, auspicious day. The Indian-Mongolian Cultural Agreement, signed in 1961, has governed the cultural exchange program between the two countries. A large number of Indian literary work, including Panch Tantra, Ramayana, Shakuntala, Ritu Samara, Kama Sutra, Godan, Gaban, and Kati Patang, have been published in Mongolian language as also major Buddhist scriptures of Indian origin. Observers believe that such events will further enhance the cooperation between two sides in coming times. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.